So the writer of the Hebrews says these words, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he cleanses us from our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. The more you worship Jesus, the greater he becomes to you. C.S. Lewis puts this across well in one of his Narnia stories. Lucy, one of the Petrancy uh, children, sees Aslan the lion, who's the, the Jesus character in the story, one night in the moonlight. And to Lucy he appears larger and shining white. And so Lucy says to Aslan, you're bigger than the last time I saw you. And Aslan's response says, no, I'm not bigger. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. The writers of the Hebrews wanted these readers to see Jesus is bigger than anything or anyone else. He was writing to Jewish believers in Rome. That's why it's the letter to the Hebrews. They were having a tough time. Some of them perhaps have been amongst those who have been converted on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit fell on those early believers. But they went back to, to Rome and the Romans hated them because they wouldn't worship their multiple gods. Traditional Jewish believers hated them because they thought they were heretics. And some of these Christians were on the verge of giving up. And we find reference to, to you know, not neglecting meeting together as part of this letter later on in later chapters. Some of these Christians, as I say, were perhaps on the point of giving up. Others perhaps had already returned to Judaism. And it's against this, this uh, background that the writer sends this letter. Uh, some scholars have said the letter is actually like a sermon. Uh, you'll be pleased to know we're not going to look at all the chapters this morning. Um, but some of these Christians, as I say, we're finding it difficult. And the writer wants to encourage them. They want, he wants them to see that Jesus is bigger than their circumstances. And you know the circumstances we face these days, uh, it's good for us to realise that Jesus is bigger than our circumstances. So today I want to consider some of the points that are raised in these just three verses. There's such a lot in just three verses. It's amazing. First of all, uh, we're told that Jesus is the unique Son of God. The writer starts by dividing history into two parts, before Christ and after Christ. This is what he wrote. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now, in these final days, he's spoken to us through his son. So we have before Christ, after Christ. The prophets in the Old Testament, or what we call our Old Testament, of course, included such famous names as Moses and Isaiah, Jeremiah, and of course, lots of other prophets as well. But now... We're told God has spoken to us through his only son, Jesus. Jesus was and is God's ultimate revelation to mankind. The ministry that God gave the prophets was to prepare the way for Jesus. The prophets delivered God's message. They delivered the message that God gave them. They received what God told them. They told people what God had shown them in visions. But Jesus was different. Jesus is God himself. His message, if you like, was first hand. The prophets delivered a message. But Jesus came to deliver us. Deliver us from our sin. Deliver us from our past. Deliver us to give us new life. The Son came not just to tell us about the Father, but to open up the way for us to know him. Jesus came to enable us to have God's life in us. So that's the first point that's made. The second point is that Jesus is God's heir. We read, God appointed Jesus to be the heir of all things and through him made the universe. And that, that, that's amazing. As lots of people would dispute that, but that's what the Bible teaches us. Jesus was there involved in creation. And that's due cause for us to worship and sing God's praises. The universe has a creator. 
the universe, not just this planet on which we live, has a designer and he keeps everything going. Sun and moon rise and set. We saw an amazing uh, picture of the moon the other night through the back of that camera, Rachel's camera, uh, when we were out on the, on the airs. And to see the detail magnified in such a way, you know, it's just, just amazing. So yeah, the sun and the moon, moon rise and set, the seasons come and go, and as Christians, we're all part of God's inheritance, we're told as well, all things. We're told God appointed Jesus to be heir of all things, and through him made the universe. All things includes you and me. So that's the second point that's made. The next thing we learn is that Jesus is God's personified history, glory. Jesus is um, God's glory in person. Verse 3 says, The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. <clears throat> this word radiance is, is interesting because it means an outshining. We, we sung, shine, Jesus, shine. This word radiance means shining out. It's not just a reflection, just as the brilliance of the S-U-N sun is inseparable from the sun itself. So the S-O-N's radiance, Jesus' radiance, is inseparable from God the Father, the Godhead, the three in one. Well, that's okay, so it sounds good, but what does it mean for us? Well, Paul wrote these words. God who said, let shine, light shine out of darkness, made his light shine into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. So Jesus' character perfectly corresponds with that of his father. So much so that Jesus could say to, to the Philip when he was uh, asking him, Questions, he said, Jesus said, look, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. C.S. Lewis's picture of Lucy seeing Aslan larger, and Aslan's reply that no, he isn't larger, but as she grew, um, she would see him larger, it is a picture of what should be the Christian experience. The increasing vision of how great God is, how great Jesus is. And this should be increasing day by day, year by year. Uh, as this knowledge, this glory, transforms our life and our understanding of who our God is and what he's capable of. The writer goes on. Jesus sustains the, the universe, sustains the cosmos. It's interesting, in a news item the other day, um, scientists have discovered what they claim are two black holes in space have collided and that they've discovered this, um, they say it happened, I don't know how many million years ago, according to them, um, it was hailed as being an amazing discovery. Now, for humans, of course, it may well be an amazing discovery. No doubt it cost a great deal of money, and they had to develop powerful equipment to detect this event. But Jesus, of course, had always known about it. He knew about all the things which scientists discovered over the years and the discoveries which are yet to be made and verse 3 tells us that all things are sustained by jesus powerful word jesus by his word his word of power the same word uh, which brought the universe into being sustains it day by day as it runs its course because jesus sustains everything nothing in creation is independent from jesus all things the writer here says are held together by him they're held together in a coherent way in a logical way there is order in the universe uh, some scientists are, are discovering this and agreeing yes there must be uh, an intelligent design it's there because god designed the universe and gave the running of the universe if you like over to his son jesus god decrees it jesus sees that it's so so this should encourage us and comfort us so no matter what people might say, God is in control, and he's not letting go. And then we read that Jesus is God's redeemer, is unique, his one and only son. We read these words, after he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. That's the NIV 
translation, the New Living Translation says God's majestic right hand. Now it sounds very grand, but what does it mean? It means that by his one perfect sacrifice, Jesus paid the full price of sin. Now remember that the people who originally received this letter were used to offering sacrifices many times uh, in the temple. The tradition was animals had to be sacrificed and the writer to the Hebrews goes into this uh, in detail later on in his letter. They were used to this multiple sacrificial system but the message that is the, the writer wants to get across is yes that by his one and all perfect sacrifice Jesus paid the full price of sin by the power of his resurrection he brought the power of death and he goes on to say having completed his work on earth as man Jesus returned to heaven took his seat at the place of highest honor but not just a place of honor it's a place of authority a place of uh, getting things done if you like you might think that that brought Jesus work to an end but no later on in the letter we read that Jesus lives constantly to make intercession for his people so even now whatever our need whatever is on our hearts we can make our requests known to him like those early Christians we need to realize how great our God is how great Jesus is